Good afternoon, guys. It's good to be with you once again. I just miss you guys so much. And, you know, I just want to say that I'm, I'm super encouraged to see what the Lord is doing in some of your lives. As, as we've been doing Zoom and just talking with you guys and, and hearing how the Lord is really moving in your lives and just being so encouraged by, by where you guys turn during this time. Some of you have just um, blessed my heart and, and impressed me so much. I, you know, in, in memorizing verses and, and one of you, I'll, I'll keep her nameless because I know she doesn't do it for recognition, but memorizing a whole passage is just encouraging and it blesses my heart to see what the Lord is doing really in this time. And so with that, Let's continue on here in expounding upon 2 Timothy. We're going to pick up in verse 13 and allow me to read the and read until the end of the chapter and we'll, um, we'll unpack it from there. So let's go ahead and read beginning in verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain, but when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant mercy to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Now, I don't know about you, but my first thought there is be thankful for your name. Have you ever complained to your parents about what they named you? Because that just, they had the choice of picking Hermogenes. So that just automatically right there is my first train of thought. Anyway, let's go ahead and begin to unpack this. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. This uh, pattern of sound words, it, um, I believe it's the NASB that translates retain. Retain these um, words. Draw them close to you. It's in the present imperative, which means that it is something that you are to do constantly. It, it is something, it's and it, it, imperative, present means that it's supposed to be habitual, and imperative means that it's not a suggestion. This is a command. So you need to be presently holding fast the pattern of sound words. Uh, um, you need to give due diligence to holding fast the pattern of sound words. What, what you know, what comes to my mind immediately is, is, one of the best ways as believers that we can hold fast the pattern of sound words is to memorize and meditate upon Scripture. You know, we have a promise from Jesus in John 14 that the Holy Spirit, or, or the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will bring to you the remembrance of all things that I have, have said to you. We have that promise, but what, what's interesting to me is that promise um, begs the question that how are we to hold fast these words if we don't even know them? Or how are we to, in that promise that Jesus made, how are we to remember what we don't even know? Does that make sense? We can't remember certain scriptures if we don't already have them committed to memory. And this is a theme throughout the Bible. Um, God told jo uh, Joshua in, in Joshua 1.8, uh, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Um, Psalm 1, excuse me, Psalm 1, verse 2, uh, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree that is planted by the water, that brings forth its fruit in its season. The Bible has a reoccurring theme of exhorting you to memorize it. Because when you do memorize it, you're able to 
allow the Holy Spirit to bring these verses to recollection, to, to bring these verses in times of need or, or in times of instruction or whatever it is, whenever it is you need these verses, the Holy Spirit will bring them to mind. He's not going to supernaturally put these things in your mind. This is part of that work out your salvation through fear and trembling. Part of being disciplined in our Christian life to memorize Scripture. Now, is memorizing Scripture difficult? Yeah, it can be. It certainly is. And I'll give you a little tough love. Just do it. You know, we, as human beings, we memorize what we really want to memorize. You know, we, we will memorize things that are really important to us. And this is one of those calls. Memorize these things because they're very important to you. And, you know, what I mean by important is that what's interesting is that the Bible mentions that there are two things that will last forever. The Word of God and your neighbor. Our souls are immortal. The only thing that changes is our location. But they're still immortal. And so these two things will last forever. My question to you is, what are the two things that you neglect the most? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, those are the two things that we actually neglect the most. The Word of God and our neighbor. We focus on all other things and we don't focus on the things that will actually last. The things that will actually have eternal rewards or consequences if you will but i love what and allow me to read real quick what chuck swindoll says about memorizing the scripture he says i know of no other single practice in the christian life more rewarding practically speaking than memorizing scripture no other single experience pays greater spiritual dividends your prayer life will be strengthened your witness will be sharper and more effective your attitude and outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and your assurance will be enhanced. Your faith will be solidified. I love that idea of, of holding fast the word, of memorizing the word in that aspect. When we realize the importance of memorizing the word. And we're going to go on to the importance because it's this pattern. Hold fast the pattern of sound words. This word pattern, like I said, in other translations, the NASB is um, translated as standard. The word in the original language means an outline. It carries the idea of, you remember when you were a kid and you used to um, write your letters, A and B and lowercase, and, and it had those little dots there. It gave you the outline before so that you can know where, how to write it. That's the idea here. It's a pattern. It's a rough draft. It's the, the underlaying. This is the pattern of sound words. The word um, is actually emphatic. The, the, the Greek word, um, what is it? Hupo, hupotoposis. Hupotoposis. Um, it means... It's, it's in, in the original language, what I mean by it being emphatic is that in the original language, it's placed first in the sentence. So the idea is to place emphasis upon the sound words. That's what Paul is saying here. Is I want you, if, I guess if you were to kind of read it as it's actually said, it would say standard, hold fast word, the sound words. So the idea is to emphasize that this pattern or this standard is of utmost importance in when you hold fast this word. And the word picture, it means to be an example in a sense of this pattern. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. In his first epistle to Timothy, in chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, However, for this reason I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long, long suffering as a pattern, same word, to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. And so the idea is that when we hold fast this pattern, we become a pattern to other people. Kind of what Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 11, imitate me as I imitate God. Kind of the same concept of Ephesians 5. Therefore, 
imitate God as dear children and walk in love as Jesus Christ has given himself and, and loved us. And so there's the same concept here that as we hold fast this pattern, we are to display this pattern. It is never something that we're just supposed to hold to. And then you see that in the next phrase, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This pattern that we're supposed to hold on to is never supposed to be rigid orthodoxy or it's never supposed to be legalistic where we, we hold it in morals but not in personal faith. We're to hold it in love and faith. We're to hold it so that we can be examples of it, so that we can express this same pattern. And you get the, the idea more as we go along in the passage and specifically in this next verse, that good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. I love this because the idea here is that, <clears throat> the idea is that God has put an investment on your life. You see, keep that thing, or that good thing that was committed to you. Not only do we commit our hearts or our souls to God, but he has committed things to us. And that's what he's talking about here, that this pattern, this gospel, has been committed to us. We are to show ourselves faithful or to show ourselves a good pattern that we would not misrepresent this standard, this gospel standard, if you will. In, in essence, it kind of, um, I mean, what, when you think about this idea that God has committed something to you, it, it should kind of, first of all, cause a reverence in our hearts that, that not only do we commit something to God, but he commits something to us. And you see this in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. You guys remember that parable where God has given certain amounts of talents? It's where we get this, this phrase. You, you've heard, you may have heard people say that they just want to hear at the end of their lives, well done, good and faithful servant. That's from Matthew 25. That's from the parable of the talents. And the idea there is that God has given you certain giftings, certain resources for him that he desires that you be a good steward of these resources and these gifts. And so we are to hold fast this pattern of sound words to be committed or, or to keep that thing which is committed. And how do we keep it? We keep it by the Holy Spirit. The next, the next phrase of verse 14, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now, when, you, when you study the Bible or when you read the Bible, there, at least for me, there are certain verses or phrases that just pop out at you. And this for me is one of those phrases. Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. I say this is the, a key phrase because if we were just to meditate on this understanding, because this is not, um, this is not a, a, a anomaly, if you will, concept to Paul. Paul constantly talks about this. Paul is constantly reiterating Romans 8, 9, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, I believe it is, constantly talking about how the Holy Spirit dwells in you. I say that because if we were to truly understand this, a lot of our sins, a lot of our sorrows, a lot of our suffering, a lot of our questions would just be put to rest if we were to truly understand that his spirit dwells in us. It reminds me of what C.S. Lewis said, I now know, God, why you utter no answer, for you yourself are the answer. You know, we come to God with so many anxieties, so many questions. And yet the answer is His Spirit who dwells in us. We come to God in, in fear and in a lack of courage and the answer is His Spirit who dwells in us. And what does that mean? It means that same power 
that raised Jesus from the dead, that same power that lived in Christ is the same power that lives in you. It's a truth that we need to take by faith. We, we can, there's nothing we can do, no spiritual exercise we can do that can give us more of the Spirit. We just have to take by faith that it is this same Spirit who is working in us that worked in Jesus. When we truly understand that, guys, our life is transformed. You ever, have you ever, you ever feel, at least, in your Christian life that you're kind of just, I don't want to say it, like uh, kind of going through the motions? You kind of feel like, like, like working out. When you work out and you hit this plateau and you can no longer lose weight, kind of the same concept in our spiritual lives. We feel like we hit this little plateau of character and we just can't get over that last mountain, if you will, of being that godly, on fire, you know, full of faith and powerful, loving Christian. We see this person, we have this person in mind of who is that example of a pattern of a Christian. We see this person, we think, man, I want to be like this individual. They, they're just so filled with the Spirit. They're just so, you know, moving in power and their, their life seems to be like they've got it all figured out or, what if, or whatnot. But they really don't have it figured out. But they're just trusting in the fact that they know that this same Spirit who dwelled in Christ dwells in, you, dwells in them. And when we fully understand that, when we fully take that by faith, we certainly enter a place in our Christian walk where, where, where we really find Jesus in our actions, in our words, in our lives. We begin to live like him in so many ways. Well, let's continue on. Verse 15, This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now the word all there is, it's a hyperbole. Because for one, we know that Timothy hasn't deserted him. Um, who else? We, we know that, as we're going to see later on in, in the next verse, um, Onesiphorus has not deserted him. Later on in this epistle, in, in chapter 4, we're going to see that Tychicus has not uh, desert, deserted Paul. And so Paul is using a hyperbole here, expressing that the majority have turned aside. They've turned away in Asia. This word a Asia is, don't, don't think of today's Asia of the continent of Asia. It's referring to the providence, the Roman providence, which would be our modern-day Turkey. And the prominent city in that providence was actually Ephesus. And so that's why Paul brings this up here in Asia, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Well, first let me go back. Have turned away from me. Th this word turned away is the same word where we get the... Um, our word apostasy. This doesn't mean, you see, it, it doesn't actually mean that these two individuals apostatize the faith. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily specify that, but it just says that they've turned from Paul. It's possible that they apostatize the faith, but that's not exactly what it's saying here. My point in bringing that up is, Think of Paul, think of where he's at right now, and then think about what he's about to say. Have you ever been forsaken by somebody? In a time of need, in a time of despair, when you need a certain individual, have you ever been forsaken? You know, I have in very pivotal times of my life, and, and it's a hard experience to overcome. It's a hard uh, suffering to overcome when you actually need these individuals to stand by your side, when you actually need these words of wisdom or just comfort. You don't even need words of wisdom. You just need them to be there and to know that they have turned away from you. What despair, what heartbreak that that brings 
in our lives. And yet we're going to see Paul's reaction to it. And, it. and it just amazes me of the example, that pattern that Paul leaves us. And, and so let's continue on. Let's see it. Uh, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, these two are named specifically. We know that more had deserted him, but these two are named specifically. Well, I, I'm going to assume that these two had done something specific to Paul. And I'm, I'm going to assume where he tells Peter, or he tells Timothy, you know this, that Timothy knew what they had done. And in fact, that Timothy knew who they were because he doesn't give any context to who these men were. He just says them by name. When, when, we're, when we're talking about somebody that we know that that other person doesn't know this, somebody we're talking about, we give them a context. We, we tell them, oh, this is so-and-so, oh, you know, from work. He's the one who blah, blah, blah. Paul doesn't do that. He just says their names, which kind of suggests that Timothy knows who they were and knew what they have done. But then he says, and this is what I want to express, the Lord grant mercy. The Lord grant mercy. That's in the um, optative mood. Opti- yeah, optative mood in the Greek, which, which means that it's a prayer. It's a wish. And so here's my point. Paul was deserted. He was forsaken. And yet, once again, he shows you that even in his desertion, even in those forsaking him, he is still looking at other people. It just amazes me time and time again of Paul and why it's so fitting he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Because he is acting just like Christ in this epistle here, in this example here. Jesus was not only forsaken by his disciples, was not only beaten by Roman authorities, but was hanged and crucified for no reason. And yet he utters, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He utters a prayer for them. And Paul takes that same example. And that's, our, that's my exhortation to you. That's my exhortation to myself. When we are forsaken, when people turn their backs on us when we need them, when people turn their back on us in general, our encouragement is to continue to look, other, to look toward others, to pray for them, and, and honestly pray for them. Not this modern, I'm praying for you, you know what I mean, where it's like, it's more of an insult than it is you're actually praying for them. You're kind of insulting their character. I'm talking about genuinely praying for them, genuinely concerned about them. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Um, first, I want to talk about this mercy and what, what mercy actually means in Scripture. The, the, the Lord grant mercy. M- mercy in Scripture has the idea that, that the, or this, in this passage here, that the recipient of the mercy is in need. And so it conveys the idea that when we're asking for mercy or when we're asking for mercy for somebody, that person needs something. But it also doesn't stop there. It also means that in asking for this need, the shower of mercy has the ability or resources to provide or fulfill that need. I love that, that idea. To put it more simply, it's to show kindness or concern for somebody in serious need and provide for them. In other words, it inquires action. You know, to, to look at somebody and just say, you know, I hope you stay warm or I hope you're fed or, or whatever, any kind of act of mercy, to just say it and to look upon it, that's not mercy, that's sympathy. Mercy is an active compassion. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan where the Pharisee walked by and said, you know, be blessed, stay warm, and then continued on. But the Samaritan actually stopped and picked up that person and took him to an inn and, and helped him out. That's the idea there is that mercy is an action. Mercy is something that it's active compassion. 
I believe firsthand that mercy is God's divine measuring rod. You can tell there's nothing better in your Christian life that proves that you have received mercy better than your readiness to show mercy. Mercy just depicts how godly an individual is. Uh, you know, and Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He wasn't saying, blessed are the sympathetic. He's saying, blessed are the merciful, those who actually act on their mercy. And that's a huge thing because, you know, in every aspect of mercy, when somebody is asking for forgiveness, are we quick to forgive? Are we quick to remember the mercy that was given to us? Because that is a defining measuring rod of, of your godliness. How far or to the extent that your godliness goes. And we see here in Paul's life, Paul is in a Roman prison. He could have been bitter. He could have, I don't care about anybody. They all deserted me. But he focuses on those individuals and, and asks that they would be given mercy. To the household, let's continue on. Grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Um, real quick, I just like that idea. Household. He doesn't pray just for him specifically. He prays for his whole household. I like that idea because your character blesses your whole household. And, and you need, uh, there's no other way of, you really have to realize that. Your character blesses your whole household. Your character can also curse your whole household. And these are things that we have to fully understand and we see it here in Scripture because then we're going to see that Paul, Paul in verse uh, 18 transitions just to Onesiphorus. Right here in this verse, verse 16, he talks about his household. So he brings up granting him mercy twice. First granting it to his household, then granting it to him himself. This speaks to me because is my character blessing my household? Or is my character cursing or condemning my household because of how I'm behaving? It's a huge uh, statement to understand the household of Onesiphorus. When we act Accordingly, we bless our whole household. Our whole household is blessed by our character. And that's obviously so. If, you, if you're expressing the love of Jesus to your household, then your household is going to be blessed by that. It's just uh, a no-brainer. Continuing on, For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. Don't miss or don't overlook that word, Often. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting, or not interesting, but I, th I just think it's a, a actually profound word in this statement. Yeah, he didn't refresh Paul once. You know, he didn't, because Onis Onisiphorus could have, you know, Paul is a, a, is a prisoner for being a Christian. Paul is about to be executed. And I, I think this is why Paul brings up Onesiphorus because he was not ashamed. He was living out what Paul was talking about in the first half of this chapter here. You remember in verse 8 where he says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner. Onesiphorus was living that out because he wasn't ashamed. He was also living out verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Onesiphorus was living that out because if you were associated with Paul, you can assume that you were probably going to be investigated, if you will. They're probably going to want to know who you are. They're probably going to find a way to persecute you. And yet, Onesiphorus doesn't sneak into this Roman prison. And this Roman prison is, is in Rome. It's in the center of Rome. It's, it's not the last house on the county line. You have to really seek it out. And we're going to see that he sought him out zealously or eagerly. And so it shows you that Onesiphorus was bold, that he was unashamed in Paul, that he often refreshed him. He didn't do this one time. He continued to do it. 
kind of speaks to us as believers. And this word refreshed, it, it, it conveys the idea of giving somebody a cold drink of water on a hot day. You refreshed this individual. Now this just speaks to me in so many ways because it makes me ask the question to myself, am I refreshing to my brethren? Am I refreshing to people that I encounter? Or am I a burden? Or do I, do I suffocate the faith in them? Or do I refresh them? And do I refresh them often? It's not just a one-time refreshing. It's do I constantly refresh my brethren? That, that's a, an exhortation to my heart. It's an exhortation to, to all of us to ask ourselves, are we refreshing to our brethren? I was not, um, continuing on, I was not ashamed of my chain. Uh, but when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. Uh, the NASB translates that zealously as eagerly. And it, it literally is the same um, definition of our word eager today, um, to do something quickly with importance, where we, we are eagerly, um, we are, are focused on that one thing to, to fulfill it. And so the idea is that he sought him eagerly. It, he's, he was looking throughout all of Rome trying to look for Paul, and, and he found him. Now, that, it's just a, a beautiful picture of Onesiphorus not being ashamed of Paul or of the testimony of our Lord. Verse 18, The Lord grant to him in that day that you know, I'm sorry, the Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Now, you know very well, the word know there is gnosko, which means a, a knowledge by experience. So, in other words, Paul is telling Timothy, you, you remember these certain times when I was at Ephesus, how he ministered to me. And this is what I want to close with. I want to close with this idea of, of ministered. And, and if you will, I want to, to turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to begin in, um, we're going to begin in verse 25, but let me give you a little backstory here. So the, the, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, are, are arguing about who's going to be on the right hand of Jesus, or who's going to sit right beside Jesus. And and Jesus tells them, you know, indeed, uh, unless you are baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And, and then he goes into explaining this idea of, of wanting to be great. Because that's what they were talking about, of who's going to be the greatest and who's going to sit right next to you. And Jesus um, explains biblically, or explains from a spiritual standpoint of true greatness. And let me read it for you uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. My closing points here is we don't know much about Onesiphorus except for this, these couple passages here in Scripture. We don't know anything else really about his life. And yet his service to Paul um, immortalized him throughout human history from being recognized in the scriptures. And the same thing is true for, um, 
Phygelus and Hermogenes. This is the only time where, uh, at least I know of, the only record we have of these men. And yet, they're immortalized by their actions of deserting Paul. They're immortalized by their sinful actions. And it's a sad thing that sometimes in our own lives, we're, we're known for that one thing that we've done. We're known for the sins that we've done. And yet we see here that Onesiphorus was known for the service that he done. Because that is truly what will last in that next life. The service that was done unto the Lord. It truly immortalized uh, Onesiphorus in the scriptures and, and it will immortalize us in the life to come where we will be recognized for our service, our true genuine service unto the Lord. That humble, meek service. And I, I like that idea because we like to be servants, but we don't like to be treated like a servant. And I, I think we've reached a certain um, measure of faith and measure of humility when we don't mind being treated like a servant. And I don't want to say don't mind, you know, not saying treat each other like a servant. But when we're meek, when we're meek enough to recognize that we're doing this as unto the Lord. We're doing everything as unto the Lord. And there's some promises, guys, that, that um, for God is not unjust to forget your work of faith and labor of love. Hebrews 6.10. Um, Galatians 6.9. Do not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you shall reap the benefits of it. And... and um, and I'll close with this. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, may, that, may we, we leave with that, is that this pattern of sound words, that the pattern that we're called to live out is the pattern of Jesus. It's the pattern of service, where Jesus was willing to be treated like a servant where he put on that apron and began to wash the disciples feet he gave us that pattern of true discipleship of what it means to be a follower of christ to serve one another fervently in faith and in love and so may we follow that pattern the pattern that paul followed the pattern that timothy followed and the pattern that god is calling you and i to follow, that we would be servants of the servants of God. Amen? And let's close with a, a little word of prayer. Father, we just come before you once again in thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word and how it just, how it just pierces the heart, Lord. As, as your word says that it is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of joint and, and marrow lord it's amazing how you discern our thoughts and how you go deep into our hearts and and lord how you desire that we would be transformed more into your image that we would look more like you father in love in grace in mercy father that we would be servants of you lord may that be something that in this world that we live in today with so many things brought against Christianity, so many things said about us as Christians. Father, may we revive the world in how we serve you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.